everyone! Welcome back to Flavor Fridays. My name is Emma, and today I'll be making rou jiang mo, or a Chinese hamburger. So a rou jiang mo literally translates to meat sandwich bread. So there are two elements to this dish. There's the bread, and there's a really fatty um, stewed pork belly, and that's the first thing we're going to do. So in this pork belly, uh, we're going to flavor it with some spring onions, ginger, and garlic. The very basic Chinese seasoning to go into any braised meat. So with your ginger, you don't need um, to even bother peeling it. It's just goes going straight into the stew. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a few thin slices, just like so. So I'm placing my sliced ginger just on a separate plate over here. Peel off some cloves of garlic and then give them a quick bash. Skins on and everything. Um, and then with the spring onions, I'm going to take the roots off and then I'm just going to slice it into maybe five centimeter pieces. Again, this is just to flavor the stew broth. So all of that goes onto a plate. So in the end, you've got a plate of all of your aromatics. So I've got my sliced ginger, my bashed garlic cloves, and my spring onions. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to blanch our pork belly. Now this is a traditional step in Chinese cooking. We do this when we're cooking with any type of meat. Um, and it's to remove the impurities in the blood, um, in the fat. So I've just got a pot of boiling water over here. This is the pork belly that we got. So it's really nice fattiness from the skin and also some leaner bits from the meat that will make a really nice combination of flavors for the meat part of the rou jia mo. So in boiling water, I'm popping these straight into the pot. It only needs to blanch for a couple minutes just until you see some of the impurities from the meat float to the top of the pot. This is a step that my dad and my grandma always did before they made um, soups. They always blanched their meat first. So I have been blanching my pork just for two to three minutes. And you see how there's kind of this strange foam that, that goes on top? Um, that's impurities draining from the pork belly. So I'll just take that out of the pot and set that aside. You don't need to wait for it to cool. Um, we're not waiting for it to dry or anything. We're just setting aside um, so we can make the stew, the sauce for our pork. So now that we have prepped our aromatics, we've blanched the pork belly, I could talk about the few other things that are going into this dish. So in Chinese, this would be called la zhi rou. Um, it's actually a dish that dates back 2,000 years. Of course, back in the day, maybe they didn't put it in between a sandwich, maybe they just had it with noodles or rice. But the base of this dish um, is this bounty of different spices that we have here. So I've got some dried tangerine peel, I've got some dried chilies, I've got black and green cardamom pots, I've got some citron peppercorns, very common that you would find in this region, and this region is Shanxi, which is where all that spicy food comes from. Um, I've got some star anise, I've got some bay leaves, a few cloves over here, and I've also got some cinnamon bark. Now this seems like a lot of spices. Uh, traditionally, you have up to 20 spices in this stew. However, there are only a few uh, spices that you need to get that really good flavor. You don't need all 20. And I would say that the most important ones are the ones over here that I have. The star anise, the cloves, the citron peppercorns, cinnamon, um, and you can go with or without the tangerine peel, the bay leaves, and the cardamom. Apart from the spices, we've also got some light soya sauce, some dark soya sauce, and actually in Chinese we would say this is sang tao and lou tao, which means that one is younger, so the light soya sauce is younger, and the dark soya sauce is older because it's actually more aged. Uh, we've also got some rock sugar. Now, if you don't have rock sugar, you could just use white granulated sugar. That's a 
perfectly good substitute. And then we've also got my favorite Shaoxing cooking wine. If you don't have this, you could use a dry sherry instead. So the first thing we're going to do is to make a caramel. Now I know that sounds a bit odd in a savory dish, but the caramel balances off all the saltiness from the soy sauces that we're using, and it also really complements the fattiness of the meat. Uh, so when we make the caramel, we're just going to make a caramel with some oil um, in a pot on a medium to high heat, not too high because you don't want to burn the caramel. So I'm just lightly covering the bottom of the pot and I'm going to add my rock sugar in and just wait for it to slowly dissolve. What we want is the sugar to completely melt and to reach a really golden amber color. That's when we can add all of the other ingredients. So now that I can see that all of my sugar has dissolved and it's become this really beautiful golden amber color, I can add some um, of the other ingredients. So I'll add the water straight into the pot. You just need enough to cover all of that pork belly. Be careful when you do this. As that water boils, the sugar will completely dissolve as well. So while I'm waiting for that to boil, I can add everything else. So I can add my spring onions, my garlic, and my ginger, all of my aromatics going in. I can add my pork belly. So with the pork belly, you don't have to use this cut of meat. You could use a mixture of a leaner um, piece of pork. You could even use beef if you want to. That would be delicious. So, I'm adding my pork belly. I will add all of my spices. Now, if you have a, um, a spice bag or a small muslin cloth, sometimes in China they will put all of this in a spice bag so that you don't have to fish everything out. It's a completely optional step. I'm just going to add it straight into the pot. I'll add my light soya sauce. I'll add my dark soy sauce, my lou cao, and then I'll add my uh, Shaoxing cooking wine. So as you can see, my pork belly is slightly sticking out of my pot, so I'm going to top it up with a bit more liquid just until the water um, covers the pork belly. Now, in order for the pork belly to really cook down and get really tender, um, and for all of those spices to infuse into the meat, you want to cook this for around three hours just on a low heat. Um, if you have more time, you can cook it for even longer. Uh, you don't even have to put this um, into a sandwich, which is what I'm going to do. You could add vegetables, and this would be a delicious Chinese vegetable pork stew. So now that um, everything has come up to a boil, I'm going to turn it right down to a simmer. I'm going to cover it with a lid and let it cook away for three hours. So now that the meat part of the rou jia mo, the la zhi rou, has been cooking for three hours, we can make the sandwich, the bread part of um, the rou jia mo. So in a large mixing bowl, I've just got some plain flour. I've got some baking powder. I've got some um, fast action yeast or instant yeast. I've got a pinch of salt. I've got some oil. The oil is going to enrich the dough so that it's a little bit lighter, a little bit fluffier. And then I've got some water as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll mix together the dry ingredients. So the baking powder, the salt, and the yeast can go right into the dough. And I'll just give it a really nice mix with my hands. Now, this dough is kind of a mix between a pita bread and a, um, a tortilla. So it doesn't puff up and rise, it's not supposed to be fluffy. It's quite flat and it's quite chewy in texture. So it really stands up next to the fattiness of the pork belly. Now I'm going to add my vegetable oil. Now I add my vegetable oil into the flour first before I add the water because I actually want to slightly mix the flour and the oil together. 
This will make it again a little bit fluffier and a little bit lighter. So now that my dry ingredients are well combined, I can add in the water. Now, as I'm adding this in, you'll see that the dough is quite dry, but do not add any more water. This is a bread, so there's not going to be, um, it's not a wet dough, it's quite dry. So I'm pouring in my water straight into the middle and I leave a small amount back just in case um, I need more and this is enough flour for all that water that I just added. So in my hands kind of formed like a bear claw, I'll slowly mix the flour and the water together just like this. Now traditionally, uh, this bread was made in a coal oven, but nowadays to make things a little bit easier They cook them on stove tops and then they have almost a lid that covers the top and bakes the bread dough What we're doing instead is we'll pan fry the um, mo, and then we will stick it into the oven to continue baking So I've got quite a craggly dough here Again, do not add any water, continue mixing, um, and the more you need, the more the flour will absorb the water that you've added to the bowl. So once you've got a craggly dough, you can make some space on your tabletop so that you can work it all together. So when you're kneading any dough, you want to push with the bottom of your palm, push away, and then bring the dough back. So pushing with the bottom of your palm, bringing the dough back. Pushing at the bottom of your palm, bringing it back. Now it looks like it's never going to come together, but just have a bit of patience um, and just knead away. So you want to knead the dough until you get a really smooth ball of dough in the end. And if there's any bits of dry dough that aren't sticking together, leave that out. Don't force it into the dough. That means that the dough has absorbed just enough water to hold it together. So I've been kneading my dough for around seven to eight minutes. and I've got a relatively smooth ball of dough like this. It doesn't need to be entirely smooth because we're gonna let the dough sit by the side and relax for around 20 minutes. Now we don't need the dough to double in size. We're not trying to prove the dough. We just want it to slightly relax. So in the same mixing bowl, I'm going to put my dough back in and then cover it with a warm tea towel. So our Rojiamo dough has been hanging out, relaxing for the last 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, depending on the temperature in your room, it might take a little bit longer. What you're looking for is a dough that is much more soft than when you first put it into the dough to relax. And you do not need the dough to double in size or anything like that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to form the shape um, of the bread sandwich. So rolling out my dough, I'll work with half of it first. You want to separate this into large golf ball size pieces because you want the sandwich to be quite big. Uh, most of the time we're just having one sandwich. So something around that size looks good to me. Um, this makes around six sandwiches. So with the ones that I'm not working on, I'll just cover them with the bowl so that they do not dry out. Traditional rojiamo is made with a rolling pin that is wider in the middle and it tapers towards the sides. So what you get in the end is kind of a rounded cup shape, uh, almost like a rounded hockey puck. Now I don't have that kind of rolling pin at home and many of you probably don't. Instead, what you can do is mimic that same effect using only one side of your rolling pin. So I'll show you what I mean by that. With my dough ball, I'll form it into a circle first, and then I'm going to roll it out. Now when I roll it out, I'm slightly tapering the sides so that in the end, I have something that looks like this. Now with my rolling pin, I'm going to roll from halfway out, and then I'm going to roll from the midpoint towards me. So, I'm rolling it from the middle, I'm rolling it away from me, and then I'm doing another roll towards me. So now that I've got a long oblong shape like this, I'm going to roll it up and then I'm going to smash it so that I have these beautiful swirls in my rojiamo. So 
I'm taking the end of my dough and I'm just going to roll it up, almost like you were making cinnamon rolls. So rolling my dough up like this. Sometimes you'll see them on the streets even pulling it away and then rolling it to get even more swirls. And then once you get to the very end, you're going to slightly pull it away and just tuck it right underneath the bottom so that in the end you get something that looks like this. Once you've got that, with the large part of your palm, you're just going to smash it down like this so you get a beautiful swirl. Now with your rolling pin, you're going to flatten it out and then you're going to roll it into that rounded hockey puck shape that I was talking about earlier. So with the edge of your rolling pin, you're going to roll towards the middle and then back out, rotating the dough at the same time so that in the end, you'll get a round bowl shape. Once you've got a shape like this, you can just slightly press with the bottom of your hands so that the middle is slightly thinner than the sides. So as you can see, I'm just pushing it with my two thumbs, giving it a roll around so that it looks like a rounded hockey puck like this. And then you're going to want to repeat this for all of the remaining dough balls. So to cook these um, sandwich breads, you're going to want a really hot frying pan. Um, I've got a really nice stainless steel here that gets really nice and hot. Um, you can use a carbon steel at home if you want to as well, because what we want to do is we want to lightly brown both sides before we stick it into an oven at 180 degrees just for a few minutes to make sure that the middle of the sandwich bread is cooked through. So my frying pan is at a medium heat. I'm going to pop my sandwich bread onto the frying pan without any oil and then I'll lightly press down on the sides as well. I will just check on the bottom of the bread, make sure it's nice and light brown on the opposite side. It looks beautiful. I'll flip it over, slightly press it down on the other side get a nice light brown on the other side and then we'll pop it into the oven for maybe just three to four minutes until you see it slightly puffs up in the middle. So now that it is golden brown on the other side, I'm going to pop it into the oven. After three to four minutes in the oven, it has puffed up really nicely. That's when you know the middle is cooked through. You can set it aside, cover it with some tea towels, and then continue cooking the rest. You can do one or two at a time. You don't have to do one by one like I am. So the meat has been stewing away, braising for several hours now. I'm ready for the final assembly. So um, in addition to the meat, I've got some coriander and some spring onions. That is completely optional. You'll see uh, in the streets with just meat. Sometimes they add coriander, spring onions, sometimes cucumber. This part is completely up to you. So when you're building your sandwich, this is what you're going to want to do. You want to slice open your mo. So just with my knife parallel, you don't want to slice it all the way to the other side. You want to leave a bit of a hinge so that your ingredients don't fall apart on the other side of the sandwich. So something just like that. So it opens up like this and you see beautiful swirls. That's what happens when you roll the bread first. Um, now with the spring onion, I want some of the white punchy part and the fragrant green bits. So just taking the ends off of both sides. I'll do a little bit of the white and the green. I'll chop up some coriander as well, as much as you would like. I'm just doing a small handful. And now this is how you'll do it in the streets of Shanxi. They will take some of the meat from the massive pot um, of the la zhi rou. You want a bit of the pork belly skin and a bit of the leaner meat. And you pop that right onto the chopping board with all of your fresh greens. So this is the meat after it's been stewing away for three plus hours. My mouth is watering just looking at this piece of pork belly. I'll just do a small piece for now. 
set that aside. And I'm just going to chop it up really fine with all of those other ingredients. Mix it all together. Now, if you want a little bit more fat, grab some more of the pork skin. If you want some leaner bits, grab some more of the leaner part. I've gone half-half, I'm happy with that. I'll get my mo, slide the meat straight into the sandwich. Fill as much as you can into it. I am so excited to try this sandwich. And then the piece de resistance in the very end, you want to, with a ladle, grab some of that delicious braising liquid and pour it all over the sandwich. Ooh, it's dripping juices. Um, and that is your rojia mo. I cannot wait any longer. I'm going to dig into this sandwich right now. Oh my goodness. So growing up in Shanghai, I didn't actually see the street food too often because it's from a different region in China. However, when I did finally find a spot, I always went back to it because I know that that spot makes the best rojia mo. So let me know in the comments below, is there a secret street food spot that you always go back to? Or is there a regional street food that you don't get to eat very often anymore? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, and subscribe, um, and come back for Flavor Fridays. So good. So good.